Okay, welcome everyone to the Center for Fiction's new virtual event space. Uh, tonight is the start of our fall event season and we're starting off uh, in a way that's unusual for the Center for Fiction, which is with a large group of poets. Um, but uh, sometimes you just have to uh, do what feels right when somebody asks you if you want to do an event. So um, I'm really happy you're all joining us uh, from all over the world. Uh, we, ha we do have two amazing fiction writers who will be on in the second part of the event who are also poets and who are editors of this great collection of poetry, uh, Chris Abani and Kwame Dawes. And uh, to, to help make the party even larger today, we, uh, we invited Poets House to be our co-sponsor. Uh, and today from Poets House, um, we have Paolo Javier, who's going to be your host for the first part of the event, which is the uh, poetry reading. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Paolo and uh, I'll see you again uh, for the second part. Thank you so much, uh, Melanie, and uh, welcome everyone uh, who's tuning in from wherever you may be. I hope everybody's safe. I hope um, everyone has gotten good rest and uh, keeping in good health. I am the program director of Poets House, which is a 30-year-old organization uh, that um, has had several uh, permutations in New York City. Started off uh, in a home economics classroom in Chelsea, then moved on to a loft space in Soho. And then for the last 12 years, uh, Poets House has been located uh, right under the ter terrace uh, drive uh, in Lower Manhattan and Tribeca. Um, it's closed to the public right now, uh, but um, we're looking forward to um, opening the Poetry Path, uh, which is a series of uh, poems that are installed along the path, which everyone is welcome to check out if they're in the area. We have uh, reinvented ourselves. We offer programs online and uh, find out all the information you need to know about Poet Science on the website, poetscience.org. And, uh, there's a lot uh, in the fall that we're offering, and um, uh, some new, some new thing to say hello. Uh, I'm so honored to be um, uh, co-hosting, co-presenting this event. Uh, uh, thank you so much to the Center for Fiction, Melanie especially, for coordinating this, uh, family and Chris, and everybody involved with this brilliant, vital, necessary, and uh, the future of poetry, uh, the series that they've been putting out. Uh, just a short note, and I shared this with the poets. Uh, I worked feverishly with Kwame in the fall. Kwame, you remember this, uh, hoping to include um, this series in the spring um, programming, but this was in the before time. Uh, I did make a vow to Kwame that I will make sure that um, we include poets from the series and the programs uh, at least every season. So we all can hold on to that. I'm such a fan of the series. I am enamored in love with this new collection. It is truly a labor of love. I hope everybody watching this, I think there's a link somewhere. Uh, please uh, uh, buy a copy because it's, uh, it's incredible. And, uh, it's a, a collection that uh, uh, consists of everyone you to share. So I will be um, introducing Poets in Groups. I am uh, so honored uh, I, to, to have been introduced to the work of uh, these poets. Uh, I think um, a couple of these poets have roots in my borough. I'm streaming from Queens, New York, specifically on the side. Um, but you'll find that a lot of the poets were in tonight are streaming from all over the world and across the United States. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first group of poets, um, Sophia Jama, uh, Jamila Osman, and Inkateko Musinga. Sophia Jama is the author of Notes on Resilience, and I just had to share with them these amazing books. Beautiful. And Sophia was born to a Somali father and an Irish American mother in Queens, New York. A Harvey Connor Fellow, she has published poetry in Plowshares, Rhino, and Nodier, and other places. Uh, 
And Sophia was also a semifinalist in the Play Arts Press Editor's Prize for poetry. Jamila Osman is the author of A Girl is a Sovereign State. I'll also be telling you that. And Jamila is a Somali poet and essayist, screaming from Portland, Oregon, a former public school teacher. Shout out to that background and former public school teacher myself. Uh, Jamila is now an MFA student at the University of Iowa. And then Kateko Masinga is streaming from Pretoria and is a South African poet and 2019 fellow of the Ubedi International Writers Residency. Kateko is the author of Psalm for Chrysanthemums. Uh, and is also a contributing interviewer for Poetry at Africa and Dialogue, an online magazine that archives creative and critical insights with Africa's community storytellers. I am so honored and pleased to be welcoming all three of you to the team itself. Sophia? Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, if you can hear me, just nod. <laughs> All right, I'm honored to be here and I'm going to read a poem called Public Television from Notes on Resilience. Public Television. As my father lay dying, what seemed cruelest that night was that truly there was nothing good on TV. We watched Harry Srinivasan roam around Central Park looking for Pokemon, obviously bored and questioning whether he had taken a wrong turn in his career. And soon my father was nodding off and I felt indignant that we couldn't at least provide him with some form of meaningful, if light, entertainment for his penultimate month on earth. My father had been a passionate watcher of the nightly news and I knew in his final weeks that the news had let him down like a bad old friend. And there was nothing decent to watch, nothing with heart or substance that could make my father cry like in the old days, watching a tawdry television movie on Lifetime with mom asleep on the love seat and me awake as he raised a hand to his face and said, don't tell anyone I cried. And I would nod slowly because I had already started tailgating during the commercials. But listen, who is to blame here? And when exactly did it happen? I think, I still think we have a choice here, but I don't fault my father for turning away from the world and from our television set. Once, he tossed our wood paneled black and white boob tube in the trash, raging like a maniac after my brother wouldn't turn the damn thing off. And dad blew up. We woke up the next day and had a color TV. And my brother slid off the hook like an old sturgeon, too ugly to eat and almost admirable in his set ways. And no, I couldn't blame my father for dying because I understood that this world was no longer for him. There was nothing good on, and he showed great courage as the screen went dark. Thank you all. I think Jamila is next. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to read an excerpt from a poem called Girls, Girls, Girls. And at the time that I was writing it, I was just thinking a lot, and I'm still thinking a lot about how to write about collective trauma without sort of using it as a shield against the violence that I'm complicit in and the violences that are committed in my name. Girls, girls, girls. We were girls once, and tragedy was only rumor. 
before the US went to war with countries we might have been born in, before bombs were dropped over cities we might have been raised in, before we got our first jobs and our tax dollars massacred people we might have called neighbors, before Noor's mother was murdered by the man she married, before our brothers grew up to be like our fathers, before strange men called us unfamiliar words as we walked home from school, before the boys we grew up with slid their fingers up our skirts without our permission, before we learned enough Arabic to perform the funeral prayer, before the first body we mourned was our own, before we came to know the geography of our mother's grief, before we contorted our bodies to fill the shape of her lost country, before the first time we saw our fathers cry, before we tried to be perfect daughters to repent for their sacrifice, before we knew there was a border, before we looked for the border on a map and could not find it, before we found the border on the roof of our mouths, before the border was English and no one we loved could cross it, before we forgot the language of our parents' grief, before we left with only what we could carry on our backs, before we returned and, and found no one who remembered us. We were girls once, before girl was synonym for battle or country or ghost. We are girls still, braids thick as smoke, refusing to be martyred before our deaths. We answer only to the names we choose for ourselves. Anka Teko, Matsinga is next. Hi, I am going to be reading a poem titled My Lover Calls Me Off the Train Tracks. He holds me, hand against neck, and whispers, Thanks for staying into the groove that God made for only his fingers to so feel my house and say, oh, thank God you're still here. Are you trying to kill me? No, no, darling, only myself. We drive home in silence. The dogs barking restlessly at the gate as if knowing that I almost did not make it back. In Kateko, it sounds like we might have uh, lost the connection for the audio with you. It might be better so we can hear you if you turn your video off, unfortunately, because the connection it seems to be going in and out. All right, let me do that. All right, um, I'm going to try again. Can you hear me better now? Yes, it's much better, thank you. All right, thank you. The poem is titled, My Lover Pulls Me Off the Train Tracks. He holds me, hand against neck, and whispers, thanks for staying, into the groove that God made for only his fingers, to feel my pulse and say, Oh, thank God you're still here. Are you trying to kill me? No, no, darling, only myself. We drive home in silence, the dogs barking restlessly at the gate as if knowing I almost did not make it back. The sky has readied itself in a coat of gray. The wind is howling. My lover is sobbing. I remember spending the 4th of July in Port Richmond, 
lying on a blanket, watching the fireworks in wonder. My host mother asked if the fireworks triggered me, if there were wars back home that sounded just like that. And I said, I came here to forget what home sounds like. Here, my lover makes Milo with too much sugar, swaddles me in a black blanket I find more comforting than his arms and says, don't ever do that to me again, you hear? I nod, placing my head in his lap. He knows that I will try again. For a moment, there is respite, but he knows. This world is too noisy and tomorrow it will start its engines again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikitekwa. Actually, we heard you perfectly these uh, last uh, couple of poems, and uh, so great to uh, connect with you. Um, our next uh, reader will include Saadia Hassan, Penny Kirikwaku, and Nadra Mabruk. And as I hold up the books of our poets, I just want to say, uh, and just a shout out to the care and attention and love um, poured into these books. There's a foreword, individual foreword for each chapbook. And uh, I'll start acknowledging um, some of the folks who are introducing the work of these poets, since they're also among the authors. So for Saadia Hassan's um, book, we have an introduction, for example, by Matthew Shinoda, who's also involved in the curation of the series. And uh, Sadia Hassan is a Somali writer and advocate for first-generation college students. She grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and currently resides in Oakland, California. The poetry and essays have appeared most recently in Seventh Wave, Long Reads, and the anthology Halal, If You Hear Me. How do you top the title for that anthology? Amazing. Penny Kerikwaku uh, is the author of Revolution of the Scavengers. And Penny graduated from the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana with a Bachelor of Public Health Disease Control. His writing has been published or is forthcoming in Tupelo Quarterly, New South Journal, Kalahari Review, Practice Magazine, and elsewhere. He is from Bonasua or Ganushua in the Bono region of Ghana. And finally, Nadra Mabruk, who is the author of Measurement of Holy. Nadra Mabruk is a poet from Cairo, Egypt, currently living in NYC. She is a recipient of the 2019 Brunel International African Poetry Prize and the 2019 Poets and Writers Annual Award. She currently works at the Academy of American Poets as a content assistant. I'm so pleased to welcome all three poets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adia. Um, I will be reading Enumeration. Um, enumeration, one. I am made smaller in my shame for remembering something happened and I did not stop it. In truth, I could not. In all honesty, I did not know I could not. Two, I keep recounting the hours, the light inking the edges of the morning without permission, the prickly sweet smell of the air, the street and its dizzying din. For years, I kept prayer over the evenings spent laughing with my father, as if they may never again happen as easily as the notebook, the camera, the wallet disappeared. Three, I wake up one day in a city I've lonelyed with my leaving, noting the newness of my life. I cannot tell you how or I can. I did not die from the shame, that's how. I memorized my responsibilities, paid my bills, but it is hard when I begin my long walk to the farmer's market in the middle of the afternoon on a day I leave home in a hurry and suddenly, a fact I had hoped to forget. 
A woman's body can be cleaved fresh as torn earth and no one, not even her mother, can put it back right. Did you know? Four. Men think they can take what they like as if no one will miss it. But I have always missed what was taken from me without permission. I wake some mornings bloated with missing. I root for it in the cupboard, the missing, and I root for it in the dirt. My hair, the men, their hands, the mist and the missing, being all that remains for lifetimes after, decaying the years, brutalizing the hours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henny. All right. So I'm reading from um, the Revolution of Discovery of this, and I'm reading the poem Revolution of Discovery. My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, King David. First Chronicle 22, verse 7. Ghana Web, news headline. Government begins demolition of judge in Bangalore to National Cathedral. And the prophets agreed that David built a temple in the name of the Lord. But can a man build a house for the Lord when the Lord has not asked him? There is a still smell of a national temple, a national cathedral, needful, not needful, in the atmosphere. And as the nation reasoned, the Lord spoke to the prophets, your hands are bloody man. Don't build a thing in my name with these bloody hands. Now the prophets asked the king, are your hands free of blood? The floods have come to take the blood in your name. The birds have taken blood in your name. They come with your hands and leave with your hands. Your fingerprints are all over these graveyards. Bloody hands build no temples, my Lord. So the king built no temples. And this was a wise thing to love me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henny. Um, and if I may just uh, interrupt before I welcome Nadra, is big difference to have these books in your hands, folks. So audience, you have to check it out. Just um, uh, for Henny, those poems, right? The diversity of uh, these collections. Uh, I can't just, I can't encourage folks enough to um, hit that button below and you know, copy. And last but not least for this group, Nadra Mabu. Thank you so much. I'll be reading a poem titled Morning on Bedford Avenue. My sister takes few things with her before leaving. Bone comb with baby hairs at the edges, wooden pocket mirror, last night's meat folded in plastic. Her cheek is stained, a smeared glistening on each bone, silver curling the beginning and end to each eyelid. This morning, someone is singing about getting it right this time. She puts her coffee in the fridge. The refrain is dripping from her teeth. She circles the apartment before leaving, searching for the answer about the sky today, what it feels like on exposed skin, the chance it may open up into a feverish falling. Somewhere there, birds are calling, lining into the clouds, into their return. We do this so often, this rearranging of seasonal skin, this standing by the front door, arguing with a stray glove, a stubborn boot, then silence after her departure, save for heat hissing through the corners. Thank you so, so much, Nadra. Um, 
I'm going to be introducing um, the remaining four poets uh, two at a time. I think we're making a little bit of time. I hope folks, uh, our audience are excited about what they're hearing. Um, and I'm just uh, eager to hear more and learn more about our poets. Uh, our next two poets are Trifina Yeboa, who is the author of A Mouthful of Home, and Adedayo Adeyemi Agarao, the author of The Origin of Love. Uh, Trifina Yeboa is a native of Bikwai, of Bikwai, Ghana. She holds a BA in journalism and an MA in development communication from the Ghana Institute of Journalism. She is currently an English graduate fellow in Chapman's University's creative writing program. And Adedayo, who is, I believe, streaming all the way from Lagos, is a documentary photographer and poet from Nigeria. He is an assistant editor at Animal Heart Press and a contributing editor of Baron Magazine. His work has been featured in Gaze, Mojave, Heart Review, Glass, The Journal, the Poetry, Honey and Wine, and elsewhere. He was the runner-up to the 2019 Savage Poetry Prize, and I am so pleased to be introducing this. Martina? Hi, everyone. Um, this poem is titled, A Piece at a Time. Some days, it is as if she wakes up, refusing to trust the memory of what happened before. My mother, on days when luck is all there is, when the air smells like skin drawing back to stick to a bone, bites into an apple which does not exist. We see her hands, cropped knuckles bent around the shape of an invisible fruit. My brothers and I watch the parting of her lips, stiff and numb, how they hunger for that which they cannot see. When an empty bowl is set before us on the table, we know the question before it is asked, what do you see? My brothers like this game because this means dinner can be anything they want it to be. Chicken coated with flour, fried plantain and black eyed peas cooked in red oil. Between my ribs, I picture the last stale bread I ate how it floats inside of me like a dead fish. How by this time, its crumbs are scattering inside my body, hoping to preserve themselves until the next meal. It comes in a black bag, the heat of steamed rice threatening to break the rubber that holds it. My mother, even as she sticks her hand out the window for the blessing of leftovers, looks back at us and whispers, we don't need anyone to help us. Sometimes it is as if she wants to teach us a lesson. My brothers and I, with our eyes bulging from their sunken sockets, do not look away from the bag. What do you see? The boys pretend to look around, begin the game of gratitude where nothing is amiss, where we cannot be too eager for a blessing because then we admit what we've never had all along. But the linings of my belly are plowing against themselves. The smell of curry drifting through the air has me dizzy and will knock me off my feet. I know mother has said my love will not stop for anything. I will feed you with my heart if I have to. But there is the bag. There is the food in her hand and we've gone two days starving. The waiting so severe, so rotten. My stomach so empty, so desperate, it eats itself. What do I see? I press my mouth to her ear. And when I speak, it is as if something inside of me ruptures. The words are smoke filled and they unfell from my tongue moving through clenched teeth. Food, I say, food, mama, and all I want is to feast. Thank you. Thank you, Trifina. Our next poet is... Hi, everyone. 
Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'll be reading from the original books, uh, a poem that I titled Bantalet Drowning in a Flower Room. Perhaps this is how you love to be seen. A shift ahead with a mother crying into a bowl, a lamp blown by a raging wind, a father's silence as he watches Baba chant into your ears. Perhaps you love your body boxed dead and growing from butterfly back to moth. Perhaps it is your joy that in this room, silence is what carries us. A father shuts his eyes against his tears, calls your name silently, but the gods have taken your body. Perhaps your name wasn't yours. Bantale is stay with me till dying age. It is also your mother calling you out of Iroko to unmake every journey you have made. Perhaps each of your exiles is a reminder that home is a paradise of woods. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adidayo and Kofina. And our final two poets are Fatima Kamara and Afia Ansa. Fatima Kamara is a writer and spoken word artist from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She is a true art speak be heard alumna who has performed all over the Twin Cities metro area. Fatima is a student at Metropolitan State University and works as the Programs Associate for True Art Speaks, an arts-based nonprofit organization that cultivates literacy, leadership, and social justice through the study and application of spoken word and hip hop culture. And Fatima is the author of Yellow Line. And Afia Ansah is the author of Try Kissing God and is a scholar and artist currently pursuing a PhD in English literature at the University of Rhode Island. Her work interrogates representations of black female subjectivities in African diaspora literature. She received an MFA from Stony Brook University and is the author of the chapbook, American Mercy. So happy to be welcoming Fatima to our event tonight. Take it away, Fatima. You guys hear me? Okay. Um, before I do this poem, I just want to thank uh, Lovin Osman for convincing me to submit to the chapbook um, submission process and for uh, to Tish Jones for always pushing me towards the truth. Um, I love you both. And I'm going to read this in honor of my love for you all. Um, this is called Obligation. It was in kind of thing that my parents met. I imagine a big gust of wind, all that sand clearing. It is then that my father saw my mother's shadow confused by how the sun followed only her, her silhouette, a guiding force, and it was that shape that led him to my grandfather's compound to ask her to leave, to come to America. Years ago, during the slamming of doors, the physical altercations, my siblings' tears, the constant screaming, I would tell you that my mother was only saying no to everything that made her feel broken. She was choosing her mental health, saying no to what made her crawl out of her body in search of a new home. No one was going to make her stay, all that maternal training forgotten. She was a person before she was a woman. She was whole before she was a part of everybody, before everybody had a part of her. She would say, I didn't kick him out. I didn't tell your dad to leave. He did that on his own. I want to tell her that the truth is a much better story but I know better than to imply a choice she was told to never make for herself. So when my mother said she'd kill herself after I said I'm moving out, Muna was the first person I told. 
She never wastes our time planning what to say. She doesn't offer impossible solutions like write her a letter. Tell her you're depressed. Tell her you don't want to belong here just to belong to someone else. Leave, leave, leave. Tell her you want love, the kind that does not keep you. Instead, Luna asks, what about your siblings? A question for my mother, but the one I always answer to. Daughters of women from the continent know we have a shared responsibility to the home. Somehow, we are mothers too, or in constant preparation of. We know that love isn't about what you say yes to, it is about what you stay for. I've seen it when Uncle Yaya died, how mom put all our resources into his children, his grave, his garden, and we continued to empty our stomachs. How when I said I would leave, my back ached. I went outside ready to call for help to carry the load. Then my mother called my phone and said, we're in the month of fasting. Leave your forgiveness for me. Spineless in my response, I cried. I told myself just a few more steps, but sometimes we encourage ourselves towards nothing. We push past our limits to a point where we don't have ourselves. We don't even care for what really happened. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. And our final poet is Sophia Ansel. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to be reading um, a poem called Nyajiji uh, and Jinyame. So um, all of my poems are um, titled after the Ajinkra symbols. And I want to give a shout out to Kwame for allowing me to keep um, the symbols in here and not just their name. Nyajiji, have faith. Jinyame, receive God or if not for God. Je in Akan suggests an offering to have someone at the receiving end, to desire to let go completely, often assuming trust exists, which is jidi, which sounds often like jidi, take and eat. Someone cooks a meal, palatable or not, boiled yams with okra stew, male crabs, cow high perhaps, gifts it to you in a clean bowl, food that may turn your intestines outside in or clean your red throat. You lick your lips and thank your tongue. But how do you take God, Jinyame, unless they mean to say except for God? For Nyame cannot be chewed on like the bones of a quail or kept in the palm like sweat. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you to all the poets. Uh, thank you, Kwame and Chris and Center for Fiction for making this possible. I do want to uh, make uh, some room to also uh, congratulate and uh, offer my gratitude to Akasha Books for publishing uh, this chapbook. And just to Afia's point about the symbols appearing in the chapbook, I just thought I'd indulge everybody by just showing that the layouts in these fantastic chapbooks. I can't encourage our audience enough to buy a copy. And uh, I look forward to hearing more about the process behind um, this incredible series from Tommy and Chris. I turn it over to my co-host, Melanie, from Center Fiction. Thank you all. Thank you, Paolo, so much for hosting that. And uh, I'm just gonna spotlight my video here. Um, Yes, and thank you uh, to the poets. That was incredible. Uh, I feel so uh, grateful to have heard all of your voices uh, on our platform tonight. Um, and uh, I'm excited to hear also uh, about how these beautiful chat books came into being. It's really like the most exciting box set for book lovers um, of the year. So please avail yourself of one uh, by using the button that's right under the video. 
Um, and I want to bring up um, the editors and, uh, and our moderator for the evening. Kwame Dawes is a Ghana-born, award-winning author of 21 books of poetry and numer numerous other books of fiction, criticism, and essays. He has won Pushcart Prizes, a Guggenheim Fellowship, an Emmy, and was the 2019 awardee of the Wyndham Campbell po Prize in Poetry. He currently teaches at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And Chris Abani, a Nigerian-born award-winning poet and novelist, currently teaches at Northwestern University in Chicago. He is recipient of a Penn USA Freedom to Write Award, a Prince Claus Award, a Lennon Literary Fellowship, a California Book Award, a Hurston Wright Legacy Award, a Penn Beyond Margins Award, a Penn Hemingway Award, and a Guggenheim Award. And uh, they're joined in conversation uh, this evening by Chawama Dema. She is a poet, arts administrator, teaching artist, and an honorary senior research associate in the Department of English at the University of Bristol. Her chapbook, Mandible, was selected for publication by the African Poetry Book Fund as part of its inaugural New Generation African Poets box set. The Careless Seamstress won the Silverman Prize for African Poetry. Her work has been supported by the Danish Arts Council, the Vermont Studio Center, and Northwestern University's Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, among others. She has been named a Botswana Top 40 Under 40 Catalyst, as well as Mail and Guardian Editor's Choice Award recipient. And uh, I am going to turn it over to you. Please welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> thank you, Melanie, and um, thank you to our poets, I think, for that uh, wonderfully varied reading. And I should also say that I was quite moved, I think, um, and delighted to see the ways in which um, you've come to this, this family of poets as yourselves and that you've given yourself permission and invited yourselves uh, to think about everything under the sun and not, and not just the spectacular, but I think the beautifully ordinary. You let us see the fathers, the girls, the violence, the lovers, the train tracks, cities, blood, temples, singing, silver, empty bowl. You let us sit with the uncertainty of perhaps um, of mothers and belonging and nothingness all the way through to the everything of of Afua's symbol. So congratulations to, to all of you. Um, a big thank you too to the Center uh, for Fiction who are co-presenting this event with uh, Poets House for bringing us all together. Um, and as one might say in Sotswana, the one who eats last is king. So uh, thank you as well to you at home or wherever you are for joining us. Um, I'm really very happy to be able to join uh, my two guests, Professors Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani. Uh, for what has already honored its promise to be an exciting program. Um, and while we'll endeavor to cover a bit of ground, uh, it's worth visiting at the end of this session, the African Poetry Book Fund website, africanpoetrybf.unl.edu, as well as akashikbooks.com, uh, to gain a broader sense of the structure of the APBF, its editorial and advisory boards, uh, the African uh, poetry libraries, the box sets from previous years, um, all the way through to uh, the work, the amazing work of the artists that graces uh, these chapbooks. To frame this conversation, I'll just quickly say that the African Poetry Book Fund's limited edition box set series is a project that was started in 2014. Um, and as far as I know, each year the APBF publishes a box set of poetry chapbooks, each with an introduction by an established poet. Um, they also published the winner of the Silliman First Book Prize for African Poets, um, and a new and selected volume or a collected works volume by a major living African poet of influence. Additionally, they publish contemporary works of new poetry by select African poets. But now I would like to recognize professors Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani who are amongst very, very many things, the co-editors of the New Generation African Poets, a chapbook box set. Chris Kwame, it is always very good to see you. Likewise. <laughs> good, DJ. 
really, 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 really good. Yeah, recognizing us all. I didn't. <laughs> um, let us try and behave uh, <laughs> as, much, as much as is possible. Um, yeah, so I, I think we don't have very much uh, time uh, this evening, though I know you'll make the most of it. So I, I will do my best to basically just prompt you and then um, summarily get out of your way um, and let you do what you need to do. Um, so within this new generation Poets Box Set series, to date, over the last seven years, you've published, I think, uh, 60 plus chapbooks of poetry. Yeah, um, I think it's almost 70 now, yeah. Yeah, it's almost 70 now. And I know you've been asked this question, I think, over and over, but I think there's a reason why people ask it, and so I'm going to ask it. Why do this? You have your own work to get on with, and thankfully you seem to find or make the time to keep doing it, but why begin and continue to take on this, this structured duty of care, this commitment that makes up the African Poetry Book Fund? I would say, I mean, just listening to the reading tonight is is why. I mean, I can't say anything else. As you described it, TJ, in your inimitable way, the range, the clarity of self in the middle of it, and then, you know, to hear African voices showing their range, their complexity, the different, the variety, but coming together out of a kind of shared spirit, um, it, it literally is the reason. I mean, it is the reason because what ha has happened in the past is these voices may have existed but have had no avenue for that to be communicated in print, uh, in, you know, in a published way, uh, limited avenues for that to happen. And in fact, I think by publishing these works, the conversations that are happening amongst the poets is something that Chris has always talked about, has, I think, sharpened and greatly sort of enhanced the work that, that is coming out. So, so there's no question about it. The moment of hearing all these voices, also knowing that each of these poets have read what has gone before and are in conversation with other poets in this, in this, in this series and in the work that we're doing, um, just says why. This is why. This is some of the best poetry that you're going to hear anywhere. So, um, yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. Fantastic. Chris? <laughs> I was going to say that's what, 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 what more needs to be said. I mean, it's, it's amazing to this evening listening um, to, because we, we read the books, we read the manuscripts, and, and you imagine the voices but to hear the voices, right? And, and not just in terms of the power of the work, it's the work is, we already know how powerful it is, but just for me this evening sitting here, I'm, I'm one of those people who cries at, at TV commercials. And so it was really hard not to, not to sort of bawl, but to hear, it's, it's also about the cadence of it, right? So, so literally, you know, Africa is more concept than place in, in many ways. It, it's, it's more, uh, an ideology than a people, but this evening, this evening, it's a people, it's a people, and and it's 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 this beautiful lineage, right? So it's a lineage. I mean, people are reading, and I'm hearing Okigbo's Heaven's Gate coming out through these poems. You know, um, I'm hearing all kinds of voices from from South Africa all the way all the way to Egypt. It's it's sort of like really that that's why you do it. It's a living archive. And, and not that only is it a living archive, but it's a living archive that thanks for certain interventions is also now a print archive. Yeah. And that is one of the interventions that needed to happen. Um, African voices get published in different places, but there's, this is the first time I, I can imagine how I can think of where we have uh, a homeland, mm -hmm. right? A homeland built entirely of language and our own imagination. Um, and where all these voices are, are housed together in one imprint, in, in one collective. You described it yourself, TG, as a family, you know. And, and, and so even more so why, you know, you were there when we started planning this way back when. Um, but even to speak to, so in Zimbabwe, when we were doing a Babylon by bus tour, <laughs> um, I don't know if you remember, but we pulled off to have a drink. Right, in this beautiful bar, and it, there was a rock 
right? And from the side we were on, it didn't look like anything. And they told us this, this place houses rock paintings, 5,000, 6,000 years old. And so I remember we were all kind of like, we were joking. We used to call you Comrade T, Comrade Demma at the time, if you remember with your black berets. And so we, we walked around the back of it. And I think we all collectively went quiet because here's this giant wall suddenly rising from a valley, right? And, and from the, the sun on the top is this beautiful thing and there's water falling down, but there are all these rock paintings, no barbed wire, nothing between us and this. And I remember being drawn to this blue elephant that looked like it had been painted yesterday, even though thousands of years old. And, and then there was this handprint that whoever had painted it had done. And I remember just putting my hand against it. And just I just started to cry because it's like someone 5,000 years ago had left this for, for someone 5,000 years later to make an instant connection. And so, and so what's been happening, we're noticing with the books and the poets is that there's this lineage that's going back into a time when there, were no, there was no print for us per se, and it's moving forward. And I can imagine all the ways I've encountered books that have transformed my life. And I can't even imagine a 12 year old walking into a bookstore somewhere and finding one of these chapbooks and yeah. finding that instant connection to this kind of lineage. So that's also why we do it. That's also why we do it. It's, it's, it's our responsibility at, at a point, And I think in a person's life, it, you have to move from rhetoric to action. Yeah. It's really that simple. And so that's what we've tried to do, rhetoric to action. Excellent. Um, I was going to ask you about archives, but I think you, you've covered this, but um, maybe Kwame might want to add something here just to kind of say, I think maybe it was Tatu, so that would have been the third box set, yeah. uh, where I think in the introduction, Kwame, I think, opens it by saying, but who is counting, and kind of responds to, to, you know, to his own question by saying, we are. Um, and so I had wondered whether thinking about both past and future archives was part of the way that you approach edit, maybe even aesthetically present the chapbooks because they are these beautiful material objects. You do want to keep them. And once you have them, you're not trying to hide them away. I certainly keep mine out in the open. Um, so maybe if you have anything to add Kwame about how you see the chapbooks as intervening or entering into some conversation about African literary archives. It's a, it's a massive undertaking that we, that is sort of energizing us and sort of driving us forward, which is that, which, which is sadly because of an absence, because of a certain level of uh, erasure, which is not accidental, but you know, we don't have to get into that, but there is an erasure, a kind of dismissing of the intellectual, spiritual, and, and genuine poet, the, the aesthetic power of, 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 of people who come from that continent and have sort of affected the rest of the world. But yet in the small, simple thing of books to be published, you know, when we started APBF, there were so few avenues for African poets to have their work published. But the impact is, has to do with what you're saying about archives, TJ. We do live in a, in a culture in which the preservation, the, the, the sustenance of a memory of a literature or a body of work, a body of intellectual work, is contained in various ways. And this is one of the ways that it is contained in, because this is how we've accessed it. We've accessed it throughout the world. This is how we access it. So in a sense, just the very act of having these works out there, staying in print, also creating a momentum of publishing. We, we are publishing probably, you know, I've, I've written recently that we are probably the, 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 the publish, publishing entity that has published the, the, the most black poets in this country. That's 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 not a that's a fact. Like the single place. Now that's remarkable in 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 that amount of time. We're doing that work, but also people are then going, oh oh, so you you know the the African poets write. Ah, let's publish them and so on. And yes, there's there is a level of anxiety and ignorance that that framed the blocking of of these voices that I think has opened up to some extent and will continue to open. But then we are interested in the port. We are doing digital work. We are interested in going into existing archives by poets who may not even have their work 
in, in libraries, located in libraries, that's the original materials. And we're looking for ways to collect those, to digitize them, to make sure that exists. So there's a history, there's a track record of understanding it. We're looking at all the media published in the last hundred or so years about what people have said about African poetry. We want to bring that to the fore and pay attention to it. It's gaps, it's, you know, it's a, so it's a, it's a massive big headed idea, but the point is, in out of that space, we call this Africa is an intellectual power that we we have we have watched stolen, used, abused in other ways, and we are collectively battling to 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 retain it, to celebrate it, to express it, and so on. And that that we don't apologize for that. That's what we're doing. In continuing to think about access, uh, although this is clearly an African-led uh, project. Um, it is, in many ways, it's American-based. Yeah. Um, so what does that mean for, for distribution uh, in terms of maybe sales or maybe more than that, in terms of readership? So far, who would you say has been the primary audience for these chapbooks? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because now we get into the nitty gritty, the grassroots of these things. Um, we, 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 with limited resources, we've created a system. The reason we went with the chapbooks, actually, and we do the chapbooks like we do, because every one of those chapbooks in the box set has its own ISBN number, even though the box set. So in the States, we sell the box set as a box. Outside of the States, especially in Africa, people can sell them individually. Part of it was a distribution problem. And so what we thought was if we could get each individual poet to carry their own box, their own poems, in the, you know, their own chapbook, that creates another kind of distribution system. Uh, because there's a challenge distributing across, across states in, in Africa, for instance. Um, and so in many ways, we depend on the poets to be the, 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 the spreaders of, of, of these, the, this product, to spread it and to get it out there and to, 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 to spread it. There's also a twisted irony of the way that the world works, which is that you are probably, it's easier in some points in Africa to get something out of the US than to get it from another country in Africa. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a twisted craziness. And, and so some of the things that we do, we are located here and we have access to certain opportunities here. But we remain deeply committed to the idea that um, this work has to find its way and its place in Africa. So current project that I'm working on now with some people is to examine distribution throughout Africa for poetry and to create a model for how we can really create an innovative distribution system of books by African poets. Poets, not, not other people, just poets. And how we can find strategic ways, grassroots ways to create a distribution system. So it's a big issue, it's a real big issue, but I think we're going to tackle it like we tackle everything, identify the problem and then sort of work hard to solve it. Okay. So we've become traders now, we, you know, we work for Mokola Market, them kind of places. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's point. I have one other thing about distribution that's been lovely is the way social media has helped us. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, just using Facebook alone. Because when you read, when you read through all the submissions we get, you start to see echoes uh, and allusions and poets referring to other poets whose books they've read uh, in such a remarkably short amount of time to find that sort of internal, very robust and very inclusive conversation going on where you're reading the manuscript that's come out of Angola and you're seeing references to a poet who we clearly know is from Somalia, right? So already there's this sort of, um, what's the word we're looking for? Not, not, not sort of a post-Pan-Africanism, but a certain kind of uh, aesthetic that's building that, it, that, it, that you can no longer localize to a country anymore, but yeah. seems to be of a moment. So the distribution, not just in terms of actual books, but in terms of an aesthetic and an intellectual process is also ongoing simultaneously. So the, the first box set in 2014 had seven poets, mm -hmm. um, and then Saba, the seventh and latest, has 11. So for you as the editors of the series, like what determines how many poets you publish per box set? We, we are in trouble, man. We are, we are just in trouble. You know, we, this, you know the process, and I should probably describe the process and, so that you get a sense of it. 
we we scour we have a lot of network people network throughout Africa throughout the rest of the world who are poets some of them were who especially we regard as we're growing a body of already published poets in the box set they become part of our network we send out a query asking them is there any poet that you know of that you think could it's ready for a chapbook box set, you know, chapbook that you think will have a manuscript ready. And we don't give them a lot of time. We, so we get all of these names. We get maybe, you know, um, up to about 120 names that are suggested to us. And then I start doing some quick work to go through to see what I can find online about these people. And so we narrow it down to 60 this time, this last time it was 60 people that we wrote to and said, but maybe it was 70, 70 people that we wrote to and said, you have two weeks, send us a manuscript for a chat book. If you have it, send it. If you don't, you know, we'll wait for another time and so on and so forth. We ended up with 62 this year, 62 chat books. In the past, we could sort of narrow that down fairly quickly between us because the work had different stages and so on. Now it's, it's almost like a sin. So this time, I had to go and beg Akashic to add another chapbook. And uh, we, we said, I said, we'll find the money to do it. So we're going to do 12 for the next one coming up um, because we couldn't cut it down. And even the ones we left out, we asked Chris, we, we're leaving our manuscript that we actually know will get picked up somewhere else. They, the, the quality of the work is that good. So, so what is the challenge? The challenge is we don't have a tr had trouble to say, we are looking at the best work, the most interesting work. We, we intentionally don't come with like a locked aesthetic. We are biased by our own sort of knowledge, but we don't come with that. We want the poetry that comes in to teach us what is happening, to tell us what is happening, um, but to see how, how effectively these poets do it. Um, so, so I say it's a problem because increasingly we are picking and going, it's, this, is, this is ridiculous because the quality, and we, we, Chris and I, we work here, we work in this business, we know what is going on. What we are dropping out is like, it's like work that people should, like, you know, it's like high quality work. So, you know, we try our best with, with, with what we're doing. Um, but it's like encouraging because, because I think people are doing that, pushing themselves, making themselves vulnerable because they say somebody's listening now. That is so important to a writer, right? Somebody's paying, somebody's going to give me genuine attention and not just dismiss me because I'm from here or there. And that is making writers do this thing with, with incredible seriousness. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you, you work very much as a team, though I suspect that part of that working as a team um, uh, shouldn't be taken to mean that you agree on on everything knowing you and Chris I, <laughs> I expect that you you're both quite uh, you have your opinions uh, so with that in mind uh, Chris are you kind of looking solely at the quality of the writing or are you also kind of aiming to be maybe pan-African in the representation of nationalities or ethnicities are you after particular themes or literary concerns do you consider gender? Do any of these things come into play? Or, you know, does the work have to do all of the heavy lifting then? You know, it's funny. Yeah, the, well, yes, the, the work has to do all the heavy lifting. And what's, well, I, I've been teaching creative writing for a long time. I've been a writer for a very long time. I've been around writers for a long time. And so it comes as no surprise to me that almost always, proportionately, female writers outnumber the men. They just that good. It's just, there's nothing else to be said about it. I have I have plenty of theories about possibly why, but but um but, but but that's something that just happens by itself. We don't we don't aim to do that, and uh, we go by the work. So it's, for what's even more I think important to pay attention to is the fact that that kind of gender differential is not determined by a theology or an ideology, but the work earns it. Right. So so that's even more for me more rewarding as a sort of say, without having to say we're trying to represent women, that the work just does all the work for us. I think there was even a year we struggled <laughs> because we had we thought we have to include just one dude. <laughs> <laughs> this looks bad for the dudes. So, so that was probably the only time we had to think of, to think about that. In terms of themes, um, so so here's a funny thing. It's 
the thing about themes is they're so varied. We're not looking for that. I think that what's, what, we're, what we're finding most intriguing is structure. That, that, and, and this structure provides avenues for multiple themes to emerge. Um, and so, do, you know, so, so it's, it's sort of interesting the way in which if, if you take even go back to say Lada Nussman's first book and look at the way she's dealing with gender in this kind of um, almost in a, in a quotidian way around domesticity, but then it's not your domestic poem either. It's this really challenging, but it's not only challenging now. So, so, so we're not looking at those, we're just going by the quality of the work. And the good thing is that I think we both, we're both very honest with each other about our own work and our own process. And, uh, you know, we, we, we exchange work, we, we, we just, you know, because we know that if you go out with a bad haircut, people will say, ah, you don't have the best of the So we, 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 we make sure about it. So, so it's, it's really interesting. And even beyond the chat books, you know, we have a large editorial board and we don't agree, but there's never any rancor. Yeah. There's never, there's never been a disagreement mm -hmm. um, in that, that you can even think of as, as approaching an emotional thing or, or an, any kind of difficulty. It's, it really just becomes about the work. But what's even interesting is that while we're disagreeing, there's so much we're learning. And we, we, today, with the, this last book said we had a, a poet who we think for the first time is actually advancing what Okigbo started, right? Yeah. Back in the 60s. Yeah. And is yeah. that one of the most credible advances yeah. of that kind of voice in Africa? There have been many imitations that have tried to reproduce, but this seems to be a different thing. And so you know, we went back and forth and we, the questions were more about how can, we, if we take this on and we're going to, because we edit after we take it on with, with the poets, right? How can we make this really reach its potential? So it's a beautiful conversation, but I think Kwame will agree when I say that what's, there are ways, there are times we read these books ourselves and we think, we don't even need to write anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> This book's are stunning. Like, why we? No, but not in a, not in a. I'm not being facetious. I'm actually being honest. Like, you, you're stunned always, not just by quality, but, but this incredible meld, right, of of talent, imagination, and everyone's difficulty is in the work, as you mentioned earlier. But there's something about it that happens in poetry that doesn't always happen in fiction, which is that it always leads towards a transformation. So no matter how many how many sort of dark tunnels you go through, you always come out somewhere in the sublime, and which is a kind of a beautiful thing because it means that all the beauty in the books are earned, right? They're not beautiful lines in the way we think of. They're actually hard-won, graceful moments. Uh, it's it's an it's an incredible privilege I I feel to to be able to do this and to learn every day the range that is out there. Like we can't, so we can't set the themes because we wouldn't get the books we get. Like we're being taught, no, we're not teaching anyone. I mean, what we're, what, what we're doing is using our experience of lying, our experience of craft, our understanding of when to stop speaking and when to speak more. Just, just those kinds of things that I think, you know, just good cooks learn over time. But, but we can't set a theme because we, we are stunned every time by the range. Uh, that comes out, you know, all, all, all the, <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking of people like Romeo, how, how do you, Romeo, or how do you, how do you, how do you theme him, you yeah. know, so it's, it's just, uh, it all, all comes down essentially to that thing, the quality of the work itself, its own ability to speak for itself. Thank you for that. I've got one eye on the clock, so I'm just going to try and uh, squeeze in a couple of questions before we take some um, from the audience. Um, speaking of editors' experience and editors being stunned, do you think it matters who edits a collection? Does an editor require some sort of specialized cultural knowledge or familiarity even with the context in or from which the work is being written? Yes, sir. <laughs> I have to say that unequivocally. I'm sorry to, you know, my mother was white. So, out of the way. <laughs> that's my caveat. 
<laughs> yes, it, it matters a lot because also, I mean, God, yes, subtleties alone, just the subtleties of language. You, you know, it's funny, I was trying to explain to someone the other day the difference between sometimes how language works as a linguistic system, kind of within African and African diasporic contexts that, that you don't find within, say, so most other languages, because of the industrial, industrial revolution and their investment in that, are entirely transactional languages. It is like literally, pass me the salt, thank you for the salt. Well, the languages we come from are inferential languages. It's designed so that there are layers of meaning within it that become clearer and clearer, depending, even with, for, for young, a young person steeped in the culture, to have more and more access. So for instance, if you said, if, if you were in a Nigerian home and you, you were eating in the living room, for God forbid they allowed you to eat in the living room and you're watching the television and you get up to go to the kitchen, maybe to get something and you leave your plate. As you're going past, an elder person will say to you, are you going to the kitchen? Which inferentially means, who are you leaving that plate for? And then your response would be, I'm coming back just now. I want to get more things. I know the plate is there. Somebody else hearing, I'd be like, why are you talking about plates? I just asked you. <laughs> if you ask an American, are you going to the kitchen? They'll say, yes, do you want something? <laughs> At which case in African home, that then there's a whole other thing to deal with. So there's this sort of beautiful, graceful way in which the nuances can, get, can be entirely lost. And, and I, what I found as the commonality across all old cultures, perhaps, is that inference is such an important part of it. And if you're only looking at, if you're only looking at what you're reading in terms of like the one dimensionality of it, then you, you miss a whole lot. Not to mention even within that, how you, what are your ideologies? How do you perceive yourself in terms of ethnicity, ethnic nation, and even as an editor, because then how do you, how, how, how do you pick in books? You know, uh, I can't tell you enough times when we've had, we put books out and someone will say to me, ah, you included Egypt, I did Africa, you know, these kinds of, you know, they, so even Africans are holding these problematic relationships to everything. So I think that it is, it, it matters a whole lot who's editing and that's why we have a counterbalance all the time and we have conversations to, to make sure that no, no point, no point of view is dominating another point of view in that kind of way. Yeah, and I, I do think, you know, we, I think we are trained, uh, one of the advantages, one of the, 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 the sort of backhanded benefits of being a post-colonial or being, is that you were forced to learn elements of other traditions and so on and so forth that were oppressing you, but you had to learn those traditions. You had a broader kind of understanding while understanding your own uh, traditions and so on. And one of the challenges that many editors who have, if they have a limited education, that is a limited uh, education, is that they do not know how to negotiate what they're reading. And, and this, is, this, is not, this is not just general readership, but an editor has to have the confidence to understand what they're reading and then challenge it if they need to, because they have an understanding of what is going on. And I think what often happens is out of goodwill, there's a kind of coyness about doing that because they don't want to offend and they don't want to look like they're, you know, they're, they're, they're um, showing some insensitivity to some, and that's because of ignorance. That's because of an anxiety about not having command of and knowledge of, of, of a, a range of things. So, so yes. So even I think have I think the shortcut is just get rid of a whole bunch of editors and put in the people who know what they're doing. But the long path is editors have to retrain themselves, like really, really retrain themselves. And I think this is not this is this seems like a, a simple thing, but it's actually a fundamental reason why so many African poets, poets even from the Caribbean and so on, were excluded in journals and so on. Because they just said it's not. It's not, we don't understand what is going on here and, and not taking the time to understand it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a bit of craziness, but like I said, it can be, it can be changed with work. And, um, and, and that's what we, 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 uh, we, we do, we, we work. Um, we work to understand poetics of different countries. Africa is full of different countries. We have to know the poetry tradition of each of those countries, have some knowledge of it, and come to, with respect for it as well, even as we are reading, reading these works. Yeah. 
absolutely. Amen. Um, so I'll, I'll sneak in this one final question and then I think we'll take questions from the audience and just kind of, I think, follow the language question that uh, mm. kind of, you know, was raised by something Chris was saying earlier. Um, and so it's probably safe to say that a number of the poets that you've, you've published are bi or multilingual, uh, but the African Poetry Book Fund is obviously an Anglophone uh, project. And maybe the answer to this is obvious, but could you say something about why this is an English language project? What is English facilitating here or allowing you to do? And do you have plans of incorporating other languages or translated work? Um. I, I would say, just to start from the, the plans, we have yeah. put out recently this beautiful anthology of translated works from, from the Horn of Africa, mm -hmm. um, from, from Sudan. Um, we, we, we are in the process of working through some translations from the French. Um, and, and we have, we have a, an editor who kind of specializes on, on, the, on the board, editorial board of the large APPF. Um, we're open to all of that, but so there, there are two there are two things to consider in terms of translation. One is simply the ability to have the translator who's good enough to render. And in fact, in one of the in instances, I think it was with the Sudanese collection, Matthew Shinoda had to step in a little bit so that you know we translate in from from Sudanese into English, and then sort of like from that English into a sort of like. Uh, much more accessible, broader, accessible English. Um, and even the matter of English itself is problematic, uh, just in West Africa alone, because we're talking about Englishes, right? There's multiple levels of, of sort of like a preaching, Creo, Patois. You know, if you're just taking from Sierra Leone, then, you know, Yamami Dinaus, Amos O'Clock, all the way through to sort of like Wari Pigeon, where how are you has become which from which one, and then the response is improvised as wizard. So you say to somebody, ah, I'm a wish, it's a wizard. So how do you even translate that English into a larger English? So there are, this is one of the things I think impeding the whole continent in terms of, in terms of things. And I think people like Ngugi have, been, Ngugi have been battling this question because even if you were to start translating, uh, uh, the, the different borders of the, the Botswana in, in, in Botswana and then just slightly over the border in South Africa, even that sort of distance creates these difficulties. So perhaps I think for us, the, the privilege for us is coming from Anglophone Africa um, and sort of having grown up in a context where it was perhaps an easier way of dealing with larger numbers of representations, that was partially behind it. We just happened to be English speaking. And we needed to get, we needed material quickly that we could build an archive with quickly. And that sort of became the way. And, and but what's been interesting is sort of the ways in which uh, those Englishes are being troubled, right? If you were to look at um, uh, January's Children, for instance, right, by Safia Elo, it's sort of like the, the, the Arabic text, not even translated in it and things like this. So it, it's sort of, questioning all the time how to break those Englishes, but that's just one level of it. I'm, I'm sure Kwame has a yeah you know, actually answer for that. I, th I think so. And I think I think what Chris says is true. I mean, the, the, we so the APBF is fundamentally operating uh, through Englishes and therefore we are so the, the, the way to reconcile at least what is obviously a necessary thing to pay attention to um, within the limitations of what we can afford to do um, is through through creating more translation opportunities, and then and so we, to, currently, when we translate from say French and so on, we publish only the English version of it, right? Um, we are now working with some translators with some Ewe texts that's from 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 Togo, um, which we will try and publish them side by side, which, which would be a gesture towards that kind of conversation. Um, but it's it's a matter of li the limits, right? So the limits are that we know that economically we can we we have a system that we can distribute the work that is translated in English or that is written in English. Um, we I can see long term that there there will be a, a kind of you know um, African languages. There could be a kind of African languages imprint, but it would have to make sense in in affordability and and that kind of thing, and an editor editorial work, right? That has to be faithful and understand that. 
But in the meantime, I think what Chris is saying is absolutely spot on, which is that um, we, are, we in, in these openness to language and sort of pushing through that kind of dialogue, these poets are troubling even English and sort of, if, if sort of extracting the poetics of their own sort of languages to have some impact on, on what they're creating and how they're communicating. And that seems very, you know, very exciting and very interesting. But we, we are looking to do more, more translation from our African languages. We have a deal with, um, with a, a prize from the uh, uh, Swahili prize. With, uh, Mukoma Ngugi started this wonderful Swahili um, prize. And the winner, if it's poetry, we, we have been working on translation of the winning book into, into, into English as well. And it's, all of this takes, takes some time. But we are, we're very keen on, on doing that kind of work. And then, of course, we, had, as Chris mentioned, we are translating from uh, from other European languages in other parts of Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Senegal, and so on and so forth, which you know to be able to have access to those poets as well. Um, so, we. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned it, but we need money. <laughs> we need money, um, and we've been doing this with incredible volunteers. And we should mention, Chris mentioned them, and I should mention them. You know, our, our editorial team, which is a completely volunteer group of people, but if I name them, Habiba Badarun, John Keane, Bernadine Evaristo, Philippa Yadavilliers, Matthew Shinoda. Um, um, uh, what, what's, oh, gone out of my head. Um, oh, our girl from who was in New England, she's in New York. Um, <laughs> This is so this is so bad. Anyway, that's that's the that's the, the, it's a team of about about eight of us, and um, we we all people are volunteering, using their energies and their time to do that work. And um, I think it's 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 one of the great uh, gifts that 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 I've seen in my life to work with people like that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um... Arcelis Gourmet. Sorry, Arcelis, for that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this might be a good time maybe to take a, a question or two from the audience. Yeah. Um, shall I let you choose the questions to, to read out and respond to? Can we all see them? No, I can't, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she, I'm blind. <laughs> you, why don't you, why don't you um, pick up yes. the question? Yeah. Uh, why, don't, why, don't, why don't you stand in? I will just put this all out. You know, if you go to the side, you can donate money. Um, and, you know, I usually ask that, you know, the money you donate should be equal to your critical voice. So for how much you want to tell us how much we fill by, you should write a check that will fill that position so we can fulfill the criticism. We're very open to change. All this sounds very fair to me. Um, <laughs> And I think we have a, a question here from Elizabeth Zetuch, Zetuch uh, apologies, Elizabeth. Um, and Elizabeth says, as you edited this collection, was or were there a particular recurring theme or themes that popped out as you put together this collection that you were proud to bring to publication? So were the particular recurring themes? I, I think for me, not, not so much particularly recurring themes, but in terms of pride, I have to say that every, every collection we bring out, I'm incredibly proud of them. Yeah. Um, and I'm not proud of it because, because of, of the curation work that we did, even though it's, it's, it's back and forth and mm -hmm. balanced and like even trying to figure out where the, which books go after which books and to make sure we, it's almost like, it's like an old school mixtape if you think about it in that way. But what I'm really proud of is just, it's just African poets. And I'm just proud uh, of a whole generation. And you notice this, there's an expansiveness. It's almost like there was a big explosion in the 50s and 60s. And then, you know, we hobbled through the 70s and 80s. And now there's, a, there's an explosion of, of talent. And, and these are the, the voices I'm proud of. There's a courage, too, that comes out in this work, right, that I don't think generations before might have even had that courage. Courage to break cultural taboo, courage to speak up even when your body is in danger, right? 
uh, people speaking out about their sexuality, about various kinds of difficulties, they've been through sufferings and so on, uh, that, that, and, and the vulnerability at the core of all of this, uh, that none of which compromises the heart. So I'm proud of that. And I stand by every poem, every book. Um, we've, we've done a, a few sort of un, unexpected um, fundraisers and our pitch is just to start reading poems from the book. So that's really how we've been getting donations. We turn up at an event and we say, we want money and here's why. And we just read yes. random poems from the books. And it, the response is always remarkable. It's, it's that's what brings money to facilitate more of these publications. Um, so I, I think that that's what I'm proud of, the, the work itself. No matter what you say, you cannot fault the work. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it, but you cannot point to a single poem or poet in these chat books we put out or in any of the Solomon books or in any of the books we've re-edited and re-released and say, why, why this? Mm -hmm. Any degree of intellectual honesty. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I, you know, the, the, the thing I would say is um, we, so at the, you know, we, in the process of putting it together, themes may merge and so on. But of course, there's a danger because, you know, Africans are, Africans are very enterprising people. So if we sit down here and we say shoes are just like a thing that is happening right now, I guarantee you next year we'll be getting like 200 shoe manuscripts. So, so, so we can, oh, you want shoe? We do shoe. I can do shoe. What kind of shoe do you want? I'll give you a shoe. So, so, uh, so but, but people can read that. What you can do is when you read the box, but this is what our poets do. This is what I did as a poet. I read what was happening and I started to say, okay, what can I learn from this and how does this make sense to me? And how can I be true to my own self and my own experience and articulate that in language that is mine? And I think that's what poets are doing. And what is exciting about it is, I mean it. I, like, I don't, I'm, I'm not joking. When the manuscripts come in, I'm, I'm excited to see what, what are these people doing now? What, are they, what is happening outside the door in, in Accra or in, 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 in Nairobi or, or, or somewhere in, 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 in Boston by an African looking out? What, is, what are they seeing? How are they encountering this world? And that to me is, is, is pretty darn exciting. Somebody else will do that work of sort of working out the themes and so on and so forth, which we are planning to get happening. You know, we're working on that side of things, but as it stands, the work must do its own effort. I saw one question, it wasn't quite a question. It was TJ Dema is like so eloquent. <laughs> We're going to very quickly move past that. <laughs> um, to our final question. Uh, from Romy Bopla, uh, uh, who says, African writers are a minority in a minority in my community. So what are some of the ways that you have successfully done outreach to help them write and share their writing, especially in this very unsocial period? Um, so maybe a, a question broadly about uh, encouraging uh, all communities and perhaps communities that might not kind of in intuitively respond to a call to submit or to the existence of the APBF. How are you reaching out to, to different communities? Well, I'm going to perhaps take this back historically a little bit. Um, only to say that APBF is possible because of earlier intervention, yeah. right? So, when I was living in England, and then the first ever poetry book, I mean, poetry workshop I attended was run by Kwame Dawes, who was only a couple of years older than me and who had come and won the Forward Prize very early in his career and realized that black British poets, wherever your original home was, had no access because we, hadn't, no, we had no mentors, right? And so between him and Bernadine Evaristo, who was running uh, uh, an outreach program at the time called Spread the Word began a series of workshops um, called the Afro Style School of Poetry, and and it was it was it was amazing and groundbreaking. People you hear about now, Roger Robinson, they, we all came out of this. Bernadine Evaristo herself, we all came out of these interventions, and then and then 
So, so then when Kwame was, was teaching in South Carolina, had a whole chapbook series for African-American poets there and book, book projects. And then I started running uh, the Black Goat Press with the help of Akashic, who, you know, don't get enough credit yeah. for how, how yeah. African they really are. <laughs> and, and he stepped in, Johnny stepped in, and the role again was to publish Black and African poets who were doing unusual things. So these interventions had already existed. Uh, we've been doing this work for a time. And in fact, all of us met because uh, we, had, we had convinced, oh my, we had convinced, sorry about that. I don't know technology. We had, we had convinced Peter of, of a Poetry Africa to do a book tour, of an African poetry tour through many countries. And in fact, this particular APBF came about because we wanted to publish. We wanted to <laughs> we wanted to publish uh, you, and we wanted to publish our big sister, right, mm -hmm. Lebo Mashile, who we love very much. And because we were going around, as you know, doing impromptu kind of workshops, realizing the depth of talent and that there's no access. So only to say that for us, it's not about this particular moment or this unsocial times. If you grew up on the continent and you are black anywhere in the 21st century it's always on social times and so this work has been going on not just by us but by other people and what's remarkable is that most of the people who end up being the most amazing poets we publish have to be cajoled by other poets by all the other networks we've developed to reach out and send their work in um beyond that i think i don't know i i'm just a person i don't know what else we can I can do or we can a person he says. <laughs> yeah. Let me go throw this phone in the ditch. <laughs> Excellent. Kwame, you agree? Yeah, no, I agree with Chris. I mean, I think the work I think what we're doing is actually making con I mean, because we, we see the evidence of what of people sending work and so on and so forth. And as an editor for say Prairie Schooner and judging many prizes and contests and so on. I know that African poets are now um, seeing their work in, in journals. You could hear from just the breakdown of all the acknowledgements that, that Paolo was, was reading for where poets have published and so on and so forth. And you can see, and that, that's a difference. That's a, that's a shift. And it's a shift that's been aided by technology, right? I mean, the truth is submittable is now the way that people submit works. You know, the, in the old days when you had to mail the work in, very many editors or very many um, slush managers would just ignore work from outside of the country because it was too costly to send it back there. It, and it felt, you know, there were all kinds of problems of negotiating distance and so on. Now everything is happening on submittable. So, there is, so people have, anybody from anywhere in the world can submit. And I think that's opened up all kinds of possibilities. Um, I, I do think there's still some work to be done, but um, we, we are in a really exciting time. You know, we're in a very exciting time um, with African poetry. And, um, you know, I think, I think people, people, people will come to see that if they don't understand that that's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kwame Dawes, Chris Avani, thank you for your generous responses and for the work that you and all your various partners undertake on, on poetry's behalf. It's much, much appreciated. And I think now, um, Paolo and Melanie, I think, will rejoin us. Um, and there's Melanie. I, I don't know if Paolo's going to rejoin us, but I send you his thanks. And I thank you all. Thank you, Chawama, Kwame, and Chris uh, for sharing the voices of these amazing poets with us and for um, sharing with us uh, all the work that you're doing to amplify even more voices. I did put the, uh, the website for the African Book Fund in the chat. So um, I hope everybody finds their way to the site and uh, to, to learn more about the work that you're doing. And uh, I hope you'll both come to Center for Fiction when you publish your next term books. Uh, but thank you for bringing us a night of poetry.